Don Murdoch is who we've got up next. Don, I dare say, is a good friend, a buddy, a pal. I know him as The Don because he does some really good impersonations of The Godfather. <laughs> uh, I think everybody knows him for the Blue Handbook, the GSE, and he is a 20-year-plus veteran. He is awesome. So without further ado, Don, I'm going to hand you the floor, and I uh, appreciate you joining us today. All righty. Thank you, Justin. Appreciate those kind intros. I'll make sure to drop a 20 in the mail. Um, so I'm going to talk about building playbooks. And the playbooks are a, a very important document for the Security Operations Center. It, it's kind of nice that I'm actually following Carson because he's talking about making things actionable. And, and I've got the paperwork side of that. So, so I'll go through where they fit in the SOC Workstream Cyclone. I'll talk a little bit about the investigation challenge. I have a sample table of contents for you, which is kind of like a meat and potatoes item in this talk. Some, uh, a couple of slides on adversary emulation, purple teaming, where they fit and then some metrics. And the metric slide, again, is another great takeaway for you in thinking about how to measure the success of your playbook program. And if all goes well, we should end on a couple of confluence examples. So the first thing we wanna think about is our security operations center is often a cyclone, all kinds of things happening in real time in a SOC. Now we talk about data sources. There's roughly 59 that MITRE attack has defined that, you know, and those aren't things like you know, a checkpoint firewall or a PSN sense firewall, that's a firewall. You know, and cloud data sources represent nine of those specific things. So security operations will have uh, data sources that feed in, will have use cases. Uh, and then the outcome of a use case is a playbook because the consumer of a use case is usually a security operations practitioner, an analyst at various levels or skill bases. So the better off the analysts get in prosecuting playbooks and solving for cases and looking for things that are true and false and escalating means you can actually do better threat hunting. Now, the other thing that's important about the SOC cyclone is you'll have changing priorities left and right. Some case happens, all hands on deck. And if an alarm comes in and we've said, look, um, that alarm came in and our playbooks tell us that's hypercritical, you may peel somebody off from dealing with the incident at the moment to work on that, but playbook definition helps empower the incident response function, the security operations function to better handle those cases. Um, next page, where's my mouse pointer? All right, so playbooks defined. I have a two part, three part definition here. They're self-contained, fully documented, prescriptive procedures. So we're actually building a physical document. The second part is that you wanna make sure that they're repeatable and predictable methods. Ensuring that, that playbooks are repeatable really helps you in the long run for automation. You know, we talked a lot about that in the automation survey last year, how you can actually improve things. Okay, so you want to elicit specific responses for an event or a metric. So when you mash these two together, and I red highlighted some of the words to really make that clear, a playbook is predictable written guidance for your day-to-day -day analyst, the person monitoring the console, receiving a notification to analyze events and alarms, because you can use playbooks for hunting, for an, an email inbound message, anything like that, and determine the incident type, whether it's true, not true, and devise and define the follow-up treatment process. So as we think about our analysts, they'll often go through an investigation. Chris Sanders, one of our fellow GSEs in the field has done a lot of research in this space. And Chris talks a lot about the investigation leverage or the investigation challenge. Analysts are gonna make decisions to go left or right, beginning and ending, those sorts of things. There's two really important numbers on this slide, third bullet and sixth bullet. Analysts kind of prefer high context PCAP data. However, analysts who drop to full packet capture, although Wireshark is cool, it takes them 40% longer to uh, answer a case. The other thing that's been proven out by Chris's research, and I've seen this true as I run my own MSSD practice for a couple of years, um, looking how to disprove an alarm condition and say, yeah, the alarm condition said X, but we know it's false for these reasons. Analysts that know how to do that and are fearless about doing those sorts of things, they tend to solve things much more rapidly than other analysts. So we have a table of contents for your sample playbook. And you know, this is one of those things that when you get the PDF, as we always publish these things from the Cyber Defense Summit, you'll be able to use this to actually build documents in your own environment and instrument, say your SharePoint site, or your Confluence site. 
Every playbook should have a formalized title, description, author, date, compliance area, program area, technical control, something like that in the title box. We also want to know when playbooks were tested over time. Then you have a discussion, which is the what are you doing about it? Some objective statement, the triggering conditions, the relative fidelity of the alarm condition, the fidelity of the data, uh, the key data that impact the playbook, how someone is going to go work through it. Um, and then you have on the upper right hand side, you'll notice uh, some problems in that sentence. You, every playbook that has any possibility to communicate with someone outside of the security op team, either kind of in an incident response perspective, communicating with an end user, presenting data to management, mid-level management, talking with your team. It is very much worth it for you to produce standardized messaging, grammatically correct, proper syntax, um, structure for your, the language that you operate in, especially if you're multilingual, uh, more and more organizations are being international. And if you have a Spanish speaking community, but your say your security operations center is follow the sun and it's the United States native English speaking uh, team, maybe you actually want to consider having a standardized message in English and in Spanish so that if you're communicating with someone for an event that happened in a Spanish speaking country, they can read that. So thinking about those sorts of things, particularly internationalization is important. Now you've also got solution support event sources, data queries. If you're going to query data in response to working through a case, you really want to make 100% sure that you have those queries spelled out, they're syntactically correct, and they're function tested. All of these things really help you if, if you have the budget and you can move forward in implementing a SOAR platform, because once you have these things well-defined to handle a particular case, it makes implementing SOAR a lot easier and a lot more natural. And then SOC should always go through validation process. Store a script, PowerShell, Python, language of choice in a GitHub repository, clone that repo, run through your test. If your test doesn't work, update the test, put it back in the repo because you paid the price to develop the testing function. You want that effort to go forward in the long haul and source code management gives us that. So, you know, a few points to really hit here. Our our objective statement is intended to provide the background and the information, the good reasoning behind the playbook. So as you build these, think about making sure that you write an objective that's for, you know, an IT knowledgeable person, someone operating in the security operations center. You want to answer the what and the why of the case, but you don't want to write these things for like a Justin or a Chris or myself or a Carlos. You know, we're, we've been around a long time, senior people. That's not the audience for a playbook. The audience for a playbook is your day-to-day -day operational team. Maybe you're bringing in a temp consultant because you know it's summertime and all of your SOC analysts have vacation and you want to bring in that temp for about a month, get him or her up to speed. Think about those folks as the audience for your objective statement. Um, where do you start with these things? MITRE framework is good, the attack chain, enterprise attack. There's also a new, new addition to the MITRE attack framework for cloud, which is really great. I actually spent some time working with assigning uh, MITRE attack items to some guard duty data, this guard duty data this week from, don't say that fast, from AWS. But think about the threats that can be deployed against your privileged users, your trade secrets, the things that protect your infrastructure, your economic pipeline. Those are all good cases to look at. You know. Think about how we detect them. If you're trying to devise a playbook for looking for C2 data, command and control, can you actually do that detection? Do you know what to look for? Um, adversary simulation is one of the things that well-developed and well-defined well playbooks can be used on the blue team side. So an adversary simulation, we're doing a purple team function. Uh, we're usually you know, it's different than, than you know, regular blue and red. Um, adversary emulation is when a red team member conducts an assessment with techniques and tools specific for an adversary. So if you look on the MITRE attack site, they have an APT simulation playbook for one of the known uh, APTs out there. It's a nice prescriptive spreadsheet with things that you can use. So if you think about where the playbooks apply in purple teaming, red teaming, and blue teaming, uh, you've got the blue team function, the defenders, guides their actions, tell them what to do. Red team actions could say, oh, the defenders actually can do these sorts of things. Can we test that? You know, that's what you're doing when you're doing a purple team function, people working together. And again, there's lots of data on this slide, good for you to reference later on. 
as you build playbooks and as you do simulation, as your as your sock works, your folks are going to have some angst. And some angst, I have an answer for a lot of those things. Technical accuracy of a playbook is pretty critical. You should not be afraid for asking for peer review. One of the best things I've ever done in the last three jobs I've had is design a playbook and asking for peer review of a senior person and a junior person. Because what I thought, and the sentence was clear in my mind, it was a convoluted sentence. And having someone review that and do peer review is really, really important. And the other thing is query issues. Make 100% sure that all the queries for your system work. If you have screenshots or you're using a sim that has a lot of the GUI content, make sure that stuff actually works. Uh, the uh, next thing that's kind of important, and, and people get a lot of angst, is what is the field that makes a difference and how do I care about that field and how do I use that field? Data dictionaries really do help. So, you know, unit testing is another really good thing for to dealing with angst. Now, this is another really good example of a slide that's kind of dense. Uh, playbooks go through a life cycle. So what I have on the top is the thought process of a life cycle and what you actually go through. And then on the bottom, I have the content management system points. So if you're designing, building, planning, and, and, and maintaining your playbooks, those are the thought processes. And then they'll go through states in your content management system. So test playbooks need to be tested. And if you build playbooks well-defined in, in a good structure in a content management system, you'll actually be able to test them. They should be tested on some sort of a period, either every six months for maybe super critical ones. Playbooks should be tested at least annually, maybe 18 months, things like that. You're gonna to have to have a period. And that last tested date as an attribute of a playbook can really help design the workflow. If you have 150 playbooks, how would you know what to test this period? Sort them by date. You're gonna make key decisions as you analyze playbooks. You're gonna keep it. It's good. Maybe it needs a small update, a little bit of a, of a text change, add a query. But the, but the point is that it's a good playbook. It works. Then you're going to find playbooks that need to be updated. They either don't work well, the data source has changed, you found this one as a really high false positive rate because you instrumented your ticketing system to keep track of the playbook so you could know which playbooks have a high false positive rate, and then you're going to devote time to updating them. You'll also need to be retired. There may be a technical capability you no longer possess because you swapped a given technical solution out. Maybe you changed EDR platforms, or maybe you actually found that the, you changed the firewall out, something like that. You may also find, as you're working through these playbooks, that you need to develop a new one and some sort of a springboard action happen. It's like, oh, we can now do this thing now? We need to develop a playbook for that. You want to organize this data, test it, use the dates as attributes of playbook development and validation, the criticality to help drive that process. Metrics, we love these. Metrics are great. Again, another you know, kind of a dense slide. Think about your security program and how many controls you have. Uh, many SIN platforms have content that maps to NIST 853. If you have a certain percentage of control functions that you have, how many of them actually have a playbook? Because that measures your ability to answer the mail on that. Think about uh, validation testing. How many do you test per quarter? Can you actually get them tested in time? So these are important metrics and measurements in how you actually work through and manage your playbooks. Never use. If you develop a playbook and no one ever uses it, that either means that condition was theoretical, it didn't work, some other playbook superseded it, and why did we never use this playbook? Because you spent time on it. Think about whether or not that alarm condition actually functions, okay? And playbook quality. Measure the effectiveness, the fidelity. Some record-keeping tool would be very helpful for you in that capacity. So I have a, as I close, I want to talk a little bit about Confluence and provide a couple of screenshots for you in the last few minutes that I have. In Confluence as a modern content management system, one of the nice things you can do is define a template that has all of the attributes that you want. Uh, Confluence as a tool has a feature called page properties. So when you create that base template, you can create a number of properties on it. Uh, you have a playbook label to make sure that the documents you create in, in Confluence are, are retrievable in your content management system. So here's an example. This is a, a, a item that I created uh, you know, specifically for you folks. We have a, a good title, we have a description, we have a control area that relates back to, in this case, I looked this up from NIST 853. 
So if you had a list of all of your playbooks by NIST 850 C, B, NIST 853, it's saying maybe that's your controls program, you can see your gaps. If you've only got, you sort these things and certain things are missing, then you know you have a gap. If you sort them and you've got, you know, 160 different categories, you're pretty well covered. Uh, then we have author date when it was actually created. That can be another very useful sorting mechanism. So here we have an example of a view. Now, based on what you have in the playbook title and other attributes on a page, you can create a view of playbooks. So if you need to create a view of your playbooks for internal audit review and to check your playbooks against your security program to see how well you're covered are, this is a really good view to do that. Uh, if you want to create a playbook with links for your description so that people know what the playbook covers, you can just use the description field. Or maybe you're going through uh, your review process. Create another view that is when the state playbook was last tested. But this is a, an example of a tool where thinking about the attributes of a playbook as you define the playbook, building a template, and then building a way to take those attributes and present the playbooks and make it a lot easier for the analysts to find these things as they're going through the SOC work stream and the SOC cyclone. So I think that is about my 20 minutes. Uh, I think I'm done and I'm gonna yield the balance of my time for the next presenter.